Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is me, Danielle Hallen. We are back from an amazing time in Las Vegas. I'm a little sad, Danielle, because we're back in the windows. Like I'm looking at Danielle on a window. She's not sitting right here. Um, it was so much fun. I loved it. Yeah. And I thought it brought like a real, well, there was a fun energy, I think, in us mm-hmm. being together, but then doing it live also. And everyone that was there in the live chat that was kicking in, like. I know that was so much fun. That was probably one of my favorite parts was seeing everyone talk, even though many of you dinged me. Yes. And even though <laughs> for some reason I, I am now known as Mr. Dingless, which I don't think I is a good it. name. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. You guys made that entire episode. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, also, a big thank you to everyone that stopped by to meet us. I know, you guys. We had so much fun. We had someone create a Crime After Crime t-shirt, which was absolutely awesome. It was like a choose your weapon wasabi pants, hot dog tongs. Oh my goodness. If you're listening, that made my entire trip. And another huge special thank you to everyone that was part of our meetup, you guys. That was so much fun. Yes. And another big thank you to CrimeCon for putting on what I think everyone agrees. I talked to a lot of people about this. They all think it was the best show yet. Can they top it? Well, you're going to have to come to Orlando September 22nd through the 24th to find out. Now it's time for results from last episode, Vegas Crimes. In the story, Leaving Los Loomis, Danielle talked about Heather Tallchief, a woman who worked for Loomis, the company that takes cash from the casinos away in those big armored trucks. And Heather, well, she decided to drive off with a truck full of cash in the middle of her workday. I spoke about Bellagio Biker Bandit, the story of a casino robber that stole more than a million dollars in casino chips and then took off on his motorcycle. Little problem, he could only spend the stolen money in the same casino that he ripped off. How did it all play out, Danielle? All right, you guys. So on Twitter, I received 46% of the votes and John received 54%. And then he kicked my butt even worse on the website. On the website, I received 38% of the votes and he received 62. I have to thank the Bellagio (laughs) biker bandit. Mm -hmm. I'll be holding on to the mug on this side of the screen (laughs) for right now. Um, That was well-deserved, man. That was such a crazy story. And the fact that he had the audacity to go back, not even just to the same place, but the same table. How is there not... I mean, I know that Zach Galifianakis is already connected to Las Vegas Mm -hmm. in significantly through the hangover, but how- Oh, that would be great. You don't even have to say it anymore. Am I right? Yeah. (laughs) Just get him, write a story about the Bellagio Biker Bandit and have him play it. Or even Jack Black. You could go Jack Black if you want to. Oh, either way would be perfect. That would be hilarious. I'd be buying a ticket all day to that. Um, Today, we are looking into absurd arsons. I mean, honestly, what arson isn't absurd, but- Today, we're finding some that are truly shocking. According to the National Fire Protection Association, arson is the leading cause of fire property damage in the United States. Their statistics show that revenge, not profit, is a major motivating factor in arson cases. Other motivations might be from simply seeking a thrill to using fire to cover up another crime. There are over 500,000 fires set intentionally each year. That is a ton, resulting in over $2 billion in property damage, and 86% of arsonists are males. Thankfully, arson crimes have decreased over the last few years, but there was certainly no shortage of stories for today's episode. Let's get it started with a case told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. All right, so arson has been something that I've actually been super fascinated in because we know how I feel about, you know, the psychology behind things. And it's also a very complicated crime. It's one that's difficult to identify, prove, and prosecute. So that's horrifying in itself, other than the fact that it's already incredibly deadly, the level of destruction, but that psychology behind why many turn to arson is so puzzling and unsettling to me. So John Leonard Orr was born on April 26, 1949 in Los Angeles, California. Now he'd always had a goal of being a police officer. (laughs) You said that like a warning, warning. (laughs) I know it is like someone needs to have some flashing lights in the background. So after leaving the US Air Force and marrying his high school sweetheart in the seventies, he decided to apply to LAPD. But unfortunately, after showing up for all the testing, which you know, this should have 
probably been the first red flag, he failed to pass the mental health evaluation. Ooh. So obviously, in ter- I know, I'm like, the second I hear that, I'm always like, no, no, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it right this here. This isn't going, in- this, it's not going to end well. <clears throat> yeah. But he ended up getting denied the job because of that. Now, obviously, he's devastated at this point that his lifelong dream of becoming a police officer had been entirely stripped from him. But he decided, all right, let's reevaluate here. The next best thing would be to be a firefighter. So he ended up applying to the Los Angeles Fire Department, and he did end up being called in. He started going through the fire academy, but again, he ended up struggling and ended up failing both the written and physical tests. So we've got written, physical, and mental totally out the window at this point. Well, and I also want to touch on, like, I guess if if your main motivation is to serve the public, I could see, you know, oh, I can't get into the police department. Let me try the fire department. But I imagine that those are pretty different types of jobs very different yeah yeah so it's just kind of weird it's like he's like the square peg square peg just going from place to place i don't fit i don't fit yeah Um, hmm. so i mean ultimately as you can imagine he was again rejected but he still was not going to give up easily so he applied to the glendale fire department And I think this was like the lowest paying. It was basically going to be the easiest to get into at the time. And sure enough, he was accepted. So very quickly, he began to fill his entire life with firefighting. He worked two part-time jobs, one at a 7-Eleven, one as a security guard at Sears. He decided to go to a local college to study fire science and eventually ended up working his way to become a fire investigator, which I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you seen Backdraft? I didn't know that. No. Oh, you got to watch Backdraft. Okay. Yeah. It's well, a great movie. I, um, but yeah, it's there, there's a fire investigator that's featured. Yeah. There. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. I yeah. just, for some reason, had no idea it was a thing. And he even managed to obtain the rank of captain. So even though he wasn't able to be a police officer, he was absolutely flying through the ranks as a firefighter, which made him and his family incredibly proud. You know, he's on the news all the time. His two daughters viewed him as their hero, but there was something very odd happening behind the scenes. Oh, wait, I just, no, I wanted the story to end right there. You know, he me got too. his dreams and that was it. Yeah, the end. Now yeah. on to John's story. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that is not at all the case. Uh-oh. So on October 10th, 1984, which was 10 years after being accepted into the Glendale Fire Department, a mysterious fire broke out in South Pasadena, California at a hardware store. Now, the entire hardware store ended up being destroyed and unfortunately, four lives were lost. Investigators arrived on the scene of the fire and then the following day, more investigators came and they were trying to determine if this was accidental or if this was arson. And interestingly, Almost all of the investigators said, you know what, this just looks like an electrical fire. This was just one devastating accident. But one investigator in particular was adamant that this was arson. Okay. You can imagine who that investigator is. Mm-hmm. John Orr. Okay. He was so persistent that he pushed them to look deeper into the case of the fire. And they did ultimately find out there had, in fact, been a like flammable product used to start it but they were never able to find out who is responsible until later okay fast forward to 1987 so a few years later a convention was held in fresno to discuss arson with investigators they were going to share their ideas the whole nine yards like crime con but you know fire investigators Mm -hmm. and ironically while that convention was happening a series of fires were set in nearby bakersfield I feel like that's just, you know, if there's something like that going on, every single investigator is immediately going to want in on that and figure out what's going on. And right away, they were recognized as arsons and not as accidental fires. So, yeah. Now, Bakersfield, actually, if you're if you're in Glendale and you're heading Mm -hmm. to Fresno, Bakersfield's basically along the way. Yep. (laughs) Yep. Imagine that. That's Mm, odd. Okay. (laughs) So in one of these fires, evidence of an incendiary device was actually left behind. Oh, okay. It didn't burn up. They found it. And at that moment, that's when it kind of became clear. Whoever did this knew a little too well how to do it. So Captain Casey of the Bakersfield Fire Department said, you know what? I believe that these fires were started by an actual arson investigator. He was pretty positive right away. He said, there's keys here someone knows too much wow wow way too much 
So he holds on to this theory in his head and he's doing like his own research behind the scenes. And then two years after this, in March of 1989, another string of arsons were committed along California's Pacific Grove during yet another arson conference. <laughs> what is going on? Is this guy going to these conferences, getting all charged up <laughs> mm-hmm. and they're like, ooh, yeah, I got to go try some of this. Yeah, no, that exactly. Is weird. Wow. So at this point, other investigators are listening to Captain Casey and they're like, okay, (laughs) you might be right here. There might be something going on with this. So they decided to compare the list of all attendees from both conferences with the help of Captain Casey. And he has been like ready for this for like two years now to see if there's anyone that stuck out as being potentially responsible. So Captain Casey managed to make a list of 10 different arson investigators that were at both of the conferences. Mm -hmm. And one of those 10 was John Orr. Now, that incendiary device that was left behind, undamaged in 1987, had a fingerprint on it. All it was, right. I believe it was like a partial one, but there was something there. So yeah. they were like, you know what? We're going to compare the fingerprints to everyone on this list, but there was not a match. So even though they managed to rule everyone out, somehow including John Orr, the fires just continued. So they're just getting incredibly frustrated at that point. It's continuing into the late 1990s into 1991. Like that whole time, there were dozens of fires. Another string of fires were set in Southern California in and around Los Angeles. And finally, they're thinking, you know what? We may have a serial arsonist on our hands. So desperate to find out who it was, a task force ended up being put together, nicknamed the Pillow Pyro Task Force. Mm. By March 29th, 1991, Tom, and I'm going to butcher his last name. I think it's Camposano. Okay, I'll take it. We're going to go with it. Yep. Okay, perfect. <laughs> he, um, of the Los Angeles task force, he decided to create a flyer to hand out in regards to that recent string of arsons in LA. Because basically there was a team called, and it's, it's lengthy here, Fire Investigators Regional Strike Team. But we're just going to call it FIRST. That's like its thing. Mm. Um, basically, it was a team created to help out the other nearby smaller cities that just didn't have the funding or the manpower to have their own investigators. They were having a meeting soon. And so he was like, I'm going to go and hand this out to them to see if maybe this is happening in other places. It basically described the MO that they believed was going on, um, described the fires that had happened in LA. And while handing out these flyers, Camposano struck up a conversation with Scott Baker, who was from the state fire marshal's office. And he was like, you know what? You should go talk to Captain Casey. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So after continuing his own research, Captain Casey had even felt very strongly that this serial arsonist, this person that he thought was an investigator responsible for all these fires, specifically was an L.A. investigator. And even more so now that there was a string of fires around L.A. itself, which meant that Camposano was possibly looking at one of his own. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine what that must have felt. I, I mean, mm. I, I'm sure you have to feel... Um like duped or yeah. i mean it's it's got to hurt you know there's yeah. there's an aspect of that that has to hurt like people that you trust these guys trust exactly. each other with their lives in some of these situations um and then knowing that someone could be doing something Ooh. like that yeah yeah betrayed absolutely I not that's right exactly word. yeah yeah so Camposano ended up getting in contact with Captain Casey and learned about this fingerprint that had been left behind at the scene of one of the arsons. He went with two other colleagues to meet Captain Casey and obtained a copy of that fingerprint. And somehow this time, which I find interesting, when it was ran through the system, it came back as matching John Orr. Mm. Hmm. I, I don't know why it didn't go through the first time. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Like, uh, was someone protecting him in some way or just was it not i mean i understand yeah. that fingerprint analysis isn't like an exact science yeah. yeah yeah it's almost it's almost like an art like the, there's you know they look for several different points and if they don't match up they're kind of like ah oh, it just it just doesn't match and maybe you have yeah. another analyst that picks you know 14 different areas and all of a sudden mm-hmm. those ones do so it's yeah i know it's not it's not like dna where it's it's like mathematical exactly. yeah. yeah this is it exactly yeah Now, since arson, as I said, is so incredibly difficult to prove, they knew that they couldn't simply be like, come on, John, let's (laughs) sit down and question you about this or immediately arrest him without getting more proof. So he was put on heavy surveillance for months, which also I couldn't imagine 
you know, having to do that, knowing this is one of your own, you're just waiting for them yeah. to make a wrong move. So he had a tracking device put under the bumper of his vehicle. Interestingly, he found it. Ooh. I don't know if he suspected anything. I've never seen anything mentioned about that. Yeah. But he did, he did find it and then, like, got rid of it. Um, but they had to go back and put a teletrack device on his car under his dashboard. And this one he never found. So when he brought his car in for service on November 22nd, 1991, they were able to view the device and it showed that he was at the scene of a very suspicious fire during the time of his surveillance. Mm. So at this point, they were like, you know what? We've placed him at one of these odd fires. We think we have enough. So they ended the surveillance, obtained a warrant and arrested him on December 4th, 1991. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. At the time, as I said, he had two daughters and according to them, he told them this arrest was a big mistake that he, you know, knew for a fact it was a firefighter starting these, but it wasn't him. And he actually knew who it was and he planned to sort everything out. So it caused a lot of issues within his family because his daughters are now like, man, there's no way we viewed him as our hero. Like we watch him on the news. He's saving people. Yeah. But unfortunately, things proceeded and he ended up being convicted of three counts of arson and was sentenced to three consecutive years, 10 year terms in prison. So that was just the start of his charges. On March 24th, 1993, he ended up being charged with three more counts of arson. He did end up taking a guilty plea during this. Um, I think there was some sort of plea deal happening and that happened in 1998. The original fire at the hardware store also started to come into play. And this was kind of like the big one that they believed was the fire that started everything. And they thought for sure that he was responsible, but they were having a really hard time proving it. And in all of the other fires, there had been no loss of life. Right. But this one, there were four. Yeah. Four different people there. So Shouldn't there be some kind of murder charges coming his way on? Oh, they're coming. Yeah. On June 25th, 1998, he was convicted of four counts of first degree murder. Yeah. Now, this was a very interesting trial because the defense, inter <laughs> funny enough, claimed this was an electrical fire. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really? Right. And I'm sure everyone else was like, are you serious? The prosecution was like, absolutely not. But they First had all those all, experts, right? Like I see exactly. like legally why you would go that way with it. Cause you've got a handful of experts that were all claiming it was an electrical fire from the start, but yeah, I get it. Yeah. Except John himself was the one person that said it wasn't. Right. <laughs> so it's just, right. it's funny that it's just funny to me that his defense is like, no, it was an electrical fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they'd actually found that other fires had been set nearby almost like as a distraction. One of them was at like an Albertsons grocery store. Mm. And I don't know, there were, it was just a whole string of them in that area that ended up making most of the police and firefighter presence, you know, on the other side of town. Um, and it was basically just one giant diversion. And according to different people that were there or conveniently showed up to this hardware store with a camera, just like showed up to <clears throat> film it. Yeah. And he told first responders that he had just conveniently been passing through when he saw this gigantic fire. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, as I just stated, this did not hold up well because he was the one who was like, no, this is arson. And he seemed to have firsthand knowledge when making these claims. So he ended up being found guilty. Um, originally, they had tried for the death penalty, but ultimately he was sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years without parole. And he also had to pay 90000 in restitution was this a case of him <clears throat> trying to use it like almost like with the bomb squad thing that i was talking about where he was trying to show that he was more of an expert in finding the bombs because he was placing them like was or trying to show that he was a better fire investigator i think that's possible but i'll kind of get into an explanation that's believed in a bit okay so during these trials actually bef right before he was about to be arrested Police ended up finding a book that he had written. Okay. It was this manuscript. Um, the novel was called Point of Origin, and it was essentially about an arsonist named Aaron who was actually a firefighter. <laughs> I know. Why did these guys write manifests? I, don't, I literally <laughs> I mean, don't why? know. I don't know. 
And it had been sent to different literary agencies in April of 1991. So just a few months before he ended up being arrested. So despite or claiming repeatedly, this is not a story about me. This is about an arsonist that I was responsible for arresting. Investigators state it reads like a confession. Right, right. So some of the fires described in the book are essentially identical, almost exactly, to the ones that he had been charged with. The method in which the main character in the book starts the fires is the exact same method that John Orr was known to use. Uh, One of the fires, it's actually in chapter six, occurred at, get this, a hardware store. And the victims matched the victims in real life, down to the fact that it stated that A grandmother and their young grandchild, I know it's sad, they had gone to the store for ice cream. And that's actually what happened in real life. And we only know this because the grandfather was with them and managed to narrowly escape. Oh, man. But then to include that in a book that you're trying to sell, like that is dark. It's messed up. Yeah. And the entire book, to answer your question, dotes on the main character's ability to outsmart everyone. Mm -hmm. And... And says, quote, Aaron wanted the Cal's fire to be called arson. He loved the inadvertent attention he derived from newspaper coverage and hated it when he wasn't properly recognized. So he was, it was a crime for fame, (laughs) essentially. It could have been in the last episode. Wow. Yep. Wow. It's, it's awful. And it even describes a lot of the motive for the arsons themselves, other than it was like almost like a two-way situation here. He liked to start it because it says in there that he found psychological and sexual satisfaction from the fires, from watching them burn. So that's, I don't know where that came from. I don't know how that started, but he found that sort of pleasure from watching the fires, but then he got even more satisfaction afterwards by knowing he had committed arson and he could outsmart everyone so no one would ever know it was him. That is... I mean, you started this story talking about trying to understand the mentality of doing something like that. A sexual connection to setting fires is really, talk about dark. Like that is bizarre. It is. It's, and I know it has to go so much deeper than that. And I wish I could like understand it. Yeah. But that he's never come out and stated exactly that's what it is. But when that book reads like a confession, it includes parallels to everything that he's ever done and that was described as being the motive and why it's done and what he gets from it obviously that's very likely exactly what was going on yeah now one of his daughters actually testified for him in court in an attempt to have them spare him from the death penalty i think she was like 23 years old at the time yeah she didn't believe he was capable of this like at all but as she got older she actually began to piece things together and i guess there were certain things that he did that they thought was a little odd and they just he would explain it away like right. he would use being this fire investigator to explain why he had an entire suitcase filled with matches and all these other things yeah and he'd be like oh well i do training so i have to have this um wow very very questionable things and as she got older she's like you know what I feel like I was used. I can't believe I testified for him. And she actually started to write her own book that is basically an apology. Oh, she doesn't. Which makes me sad. I know. I mean, if it I hope it's part of a process of her like going through and processing it and healing in some way. But um, I it, I would see the benefit in doing it from that angle. In terms of the public's benefit, they're not owed any apology for her wanting to stand behind well, her father. And I mean, so what she was basically saying was that she wanted to apologize to the victims' families. Oh, okay. okay. Because she was like, you know, I she said she felt guilty for testifying for her father. Yeah. yeah. And she was like, I in reality had no clue what was happening. Like he didn't tell me anything. He just told us this was all a misunderstanding and. She's like, looking back, I, you know, I realized he only let me come to two very specific days of the trial. I realized he, you know, all these different things. She read his books and was, I don't even know the word. I don't want to put a word into her mouth, but she was just like, she couldn't believe what she was reading. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> she basically wanted to write a book because she said she, it, discovering that her father was responsible for this sort of thing. 
I can't imagine what that feels like. And she basically said, not many people understand that feeling. And so she wanted to put it out there that you're not alone. You know, she compared it to, um, you know, finding out someone in your family is a serial killer or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you, it's someone that you thought you could trust or that you understood. And she's like, you know, this happens. And unfortunately, it's hard to navigate and we can all be here for each other. So I could see that being a, a really yeah. good benefit for people that are dealing with that situation too. So, and I like, exactly. I like where her focus is at in terms mm -hmm. of it's, she wants to help other people with that experience. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one thing I did find interesting is that a forensic psychiatrist did testify and he stated that or started the fires because of an uncontrollable compulsion that he had. Okay. Yeah. But I saw absolutely no explanation of this and I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just being I'm just being frank here. I don't know if I believe it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know cuz when you wrap a sexualized component into this kind of stuff, like that yeah. that drive is completely different. If he connected those things in his head for mm. some reason, that the only way he could feel pleasure yeah. like that was through fires. Yep. Like what would stop him? Like exactly. he would feel almost like it's a biological need that he has to go and do that for himself. Um, yeah, that yep. is insane. Uh, yep. This and case, if you guys do want to look more into yeah. it, it's referred to as the pillow pyro. We're just, mm -hmm. we're trying to not share too much about how these mechanisms work, but yeah. a pillow was used for starting some of these in some way. Yeah. So that's, that's why he was named that. Yep. And in total, he ended up being convicted of 20 arsons including something that they called a firestorm. It destroyed 70 homes in Glendale in June of 1990. Oh. He also was responsible for starting a fire in the Warner Brothers parking lot that destroyed the set for the TV show, The Waltons. I was just going to bring this up because <clears throat> yeah. Glendale uh, can be really dry and hot during certain mm -hmm. parts of the year, and it's not far from Universal. And we talked previously about all the fires that happen at Universal, if, yep. they're, <laughs> if they're set by people or <clears throat> not. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, fires in that area can be really, really tough. They, they've also got some r really nasty winds that come through that area, so they can mm -hmm. move quickly. But 70 homes destroyed? Yeah, 70 homes. Absolutely wild. They theorize that he started well over 2,000 fires between 1984 and 1991. And after he was arrested, the number of brush fires in the area decreased by, get this, 90%. <laughs> I like didn't believe that when I read it. <laughs> I was like, you got to be joking. That's terrible. That's terrible. Yeah. So he still to this day says he's innocent. He's also written an autobiography saying the legal system did him dirty, all these things. But I just, I don't know about that. And District Attorney Michael Cabral stated, the lesson that this case teaches us is that no one should be above suspicion when it comes to criminal activity. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thankful that there wasn't some type of you know, brotherhood of firefighters code that kind of kept him protected through all well, that. Well, according to Michael Cabral, there were apparently some instances where other investigators felt that something wasn't right, but for a long time it was overlooked because of his position and the fire service. Okay. So it seems there was some of that, but not by no means as bad as it could have been. Yeah. I mean, but when you get to the point that they're putting trackers on his car and stuff like that, like, yeah. you know that they're heading the right way with it but admittedly yeah. and I don't, with his rank like it's still yeah. a rank system you're still going to have exactly. people that are like oh i'm not going to go up against that but well and i'm sure honestly i feel like it was probably more of a giving him the benefit of the doubt sort of thing that mm. no i don't think he would do that you know what i mean yeah and not so much like i know he's doing this and i'm gonna hide it right, right. i think it was probably a there's no way <laughs> you yeah. know like his daughter's thought so wow Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huge thank you to uh, Ranker, AETV.com, Oxygen, the California Sun, the Daily Beast for all the information. And a big thank you to Danielle Hallen for putting that all together <laughs> and sharing it with us. Um, well, thanks, John. That was a really good story. <laughs> Can I find something to match up against that? Yeah. It's a big task, but... Uh, You've been kicking butt lately, so I've got faith. <laughs> I took a shot at it. Let's see what happens on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. Have you ever burned your dinner so bad that an arson investigator showed up? Don't let it happen to you. Get HelloFresh and use their recipe cards for a perfect meal every time. 
HelloFresh delivers fresh, high-quality, pre-portioned ingredients and is 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant. It's even cheaper than grocery shopping, so you won't burn a hole in your pocket. Take it from Master Chef Lord and Ramsay. You're seriously going to try to make that stick. <laughs> oh, it's sticking, Danielle. Lord and Ramsay wants to let you know that if you're going away this summer, it's easy to update your address on the HelloFresh app and have it delivered to wherever you're staying. That means that I can have my favorite meal, those flavorful black bean poblano enchiladas while I'm vacationing on the beach. The spice, the beans, the salsa, you guys, all while having it on vacation, absolute perfection. Go to hellofresh.com slash crimeaftercrime16 and use code crimeaftercrime16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Spend less time at the store and more time enjoying summer. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and use code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. This commercial endorsed by Lord & Ramsey Enterprises, LLC, mm. FQR, Oh, ST good grief, y John. <laughs> Try America's number one meal kit today. Bombas's mission is simple. Make the most comfortable clothes ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. So when you buy Bombas, you're also giving to someone in need. Bombas customers like you have helped donate over 50 million items of essential clothing. If that isn't enough to make you feel amazing, wait until you try this stuff on. When I open my sock drawer, I'm always grabbing my Bombas first. They're soft, seamless, and keep my feet cozy in rainy or snowy Minnesota days. Hands down, the best socks I've ever worn. And for people that actually like the sun, they have no-show socks <laughs> that are designed for comfort while being specially engineered to never fall down, which is important. Their products are made from premium, super soft materials like merino wool, pima cotton, and even cashmere. And they have more than socks. Their underwear and t-shirts are made with invisible seams and soft fabrics. The colors and designs that I found feel like they were made just for me. Danielle was also super impressed with their happiness guarantee. That's right, your items are guaranteed against hungry dogs and squirrel theft. Important things, I'm serious. Bombas has you covered, so give them a try. Go to bombas.com slash crime after crime and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash crime after crime for 20% off bombas.com slash crime after crime. Treat yourself and help someone else at the same time at bombas.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for John to tell his story. Here we go. I know, I like titling my stories. You don't seem to like doing that, but I, I don't. Do. Yeah. I like that, though. I think about that all the time. I'm like, the way that you write your stories is very different from the way I do. And you always title yours and I look forward to it. But yeah. well, and then you end up titling mine and I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yours will have a title by the time I put up the, I know, the, by the, time the voting this is done. polls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this might sound like the title for a children's story, but it's not. The title for this one is Mr. Flair, the Friday Firebug. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like a children's story? That does. Yeah. That does. Mr. I Flair, like it. the Friday Firebug. I like even just pictured a cute lightning bug when you said yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> In the early 1980s, national media started calling Boston, Massachusetts, the arson capital of the world. That's there quite were a name. <laughs> I know. A name you don't want associated <laughs> no, not at with all. your town. There were literally hundreds of fires being set and an estimated $25 million in property damage because of them. Most of the fires were set in metal trash bins and vacant buildings like churches, factories, and even a lumber yard. There was a clear spike for approximately 10 to 14 months, while the largest fire was the Spiro Toy Company. It caused $13 million in damage just in that one instance. Good grief. Some say that the fires continue on, continued on for years, possibly up until 1984. The arsonist seemed to know what he was doing. Sound familiar, Danielle? It sure does. I know where this is going. Mm, do you? <laughs> oh, no. <gasps> Am I wrong? Okay. Wait, we'll All see. Right. <laughs> Uh, he was consistent with how he started the fires hmm. using an incendiary device known as a La Bamba, B-O-M-B-A-A, -A, instead of La Bamba, like L-A-B-A-M-B-A. -A. Oh, okay. 
Uh, fire alarm boxes were stolen from the arson sites. So that would delay the response from the fire department yeah. and ensure that the blazes were huge and out of control by the time the fire truck showed up. As fear gripped the city and ran public safety services thin, the arsonist sent a taunting letter to a local television station, a letter with a strange demand composed of clipped characters from different magazines, kind of like a ransom note. Mm -hmm. It read, I'm Mr. Flair. You know me as the Friday firebug. I will continue till all deactivated police and fire equipment is brought back. What on earth? I feel like I'm in a Marvel movie. We're going to find out. <laughs> the story was gaining national news coverage and investigators, including one from the ATF named Wayne Miller, were feeling the pressure. He had recently transferred to the arson unit and was assigned to a task force to address fires in Boston. Uh, he actually, he started that job just yeah. a year or two before these started. It wasn't a task force specifically mm -hmm. you know, for this occurrence, but uh, he worked every tip that came his way. One of those tips led to a cameraman for WBZ, this guy named Nate Whitmore. He had footage of a fire that happened at Hyde Park. In that footage, they could see a Boston police officer. He was literally cheering at the flames and waving his gun around in the air. Did they just find Mr. Flair? I am envisioning that perfectly. Isn't that crazy? It's a weird visual. <laughs> I mean, kind of tying it back to your story where we were talking about this guy yeah. getting like a sexual charge off the fire. Exactly. I mean, this guy's cheering on the fire, waving his gun around. <laughs> like that's, yeah, I think that's yeah. kind of tapping the same the same note there. Uh, it turned out to be an officer named Robert Grabluski. Agent Miller had also heard that Grabluski might be involved in a stolen car, a car that looked a lot like a police cruiser. Of course, they had that footage of him at the Hyde Park fire, but mm -hmm. they didn't have quite enough to charge him with anything related to the fires. So they drummed up some charges about stolen car parts so that they could question him. Mm -hmm. Agent Miller showed up at Grabluski's home and in his living room, Miller saw a stolen fire alarm box, just like one that was stolen from the scene of one of these places to delay mm -hmm. the fire department Fascinating. response. Grabluski sang like a canary <laughs> just gave it right up but no one expected this tune quote in the very first interview he rattled off 29 fires miller said oh boy but danielle there was a twist these fires weren't started only by him he told investigators about all of his sparkies or accomplices donald stackpole greg bemis wayne sandon Ray Norton Jr., Joseph Gorman, Leonard Kendall Jr., and Christopher Damon. There was an entire crime ring of arsonists, eight in total, and most were police officers and firefighters. Oh, that stings. Yeah. That's I'll do, rough. I'll do you one even worse. Lendl Kendall Jr., or Leonard mm -hmm. Kendall Jr., he was an Air Force firefighter part of this group oh, as well come on yep and uh Grabluski just gave them all up to agent miller quote i couldn't believe this boston cop was implicating other public people he said the conspiracy was more than a hundred fires he didn't realize it was actually more than 200 the boston arson ring initially began with vandalism and nuisance fires breaking windows and setting dumpsters on fire when these acts failed to attract attention they escalated to two, three, and four alarm fires, torching abandoned buildings, factories, and even the Massachusetts Fire Academy. <laughs> I'm struggling to understand. Like, it's so hard for me to understand why people would do these kinds of things for yeah. attention, yeah. especially like given their job. Like, what, what is missing? You know, like, what are you missing here that makes you want to do this? Well, and remember the note from Mr. Flair. He's, <laughs> yeah, he seems to be like, complaining about services, about there not being enough police and fire equipment. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, what? and they torch the fire academy? Like, it doesn't even make sense. Um, quote, it became such a big game for them, Miller said. It became an absolute game of cat and mouse. They were having fun. They actually set up to seven fires in one night. So now 
as you were asking, Danielle, you're mm -hmm. wondering, like, why would people sworn yeah. to serve and protect do this? <clears throat> well, in 1980, a law known as Proposition Two and a Half was passed. This law put a 2.5% limit on how much revenue could be raised by property taxes in Massachusetts. Guess what services use that money, Danielle? Oh, boy. Public safety. Yeah. Such as police departments and fire stations. So it's set to go into effect in 1981. And this law essentially creates a budget crisis that wound up costing about 650 police officers their job and 550 <laughs> firefighters their jobs. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Yeah. Uh, Agent Miller, who would go on to write a book about all of all, all of this, uh, stated, quote, simply put, they decided they needed to start setting fires in order to get responses from the residents, press, and leaders of the city of Boston in order to get their firefighter friends back on job. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, I hate that. Well, don't, don't get too sad about it because he also notes something really strange. Quote, None of these guys were laid off themselves. Oh, man. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Never mind. I take it all back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. None of these guys lost their jobs. They were all still working. They were just supposedly doing this for their friends that had lost their jobs. Uh, quote, they were doing it in a twisted Robin Hood type of venture. Mm -hmm. They thought if they burned enough buildings, then their friends would be rehired. It was crazy. Um, I don't know if I kept it in here. So I'm sorry if I repeat this later, but effectively... Um, the the state recognizes that there's a problem with all this going on and mm -hmm. within the next year they just reverse that law so i mean i mean i yeah. think the the 2.5 percent holds but they effectively say we can't have all those police and firefighters go rehire them so everyone that lost yeah. their job essentially does get it back eventually okay well, um, many people question if the arson ring was really about political pressure or if they were serving whatever needs suited them. As a matter of fact, legal documents about this case note that the ringleader, Donald Stackpole, mm -hmm. did not share the group's goal of promoting public funding. He thought firefighters were overpaid and underworked, and he merely wanted to harass them. Oh, that's good. <laughs> You're not doing enough, let me, let me help you. Isn't this guy terrible? <laughs> get this it's not it's not over <clears throat> he would reportedly dress up as a fire chief pretending to be from a station that didn't exist he are would, you or, serious yes he would arrive on fire scenes in a red station wagon that was his own car but it was made to look up like it was official and then he would heckle the firefighters <sighs> that were actually fighting the blazes about what they were doing wrong or <laughs> that's boredom right there like that's all that is that's just someone wanted to do something to entertain themselves yeah, I, I just thought of a word I can't say on this show for this guy. Uh, <laughs> and the red station wagon wasn't the only fake official looking vehicle the group used. Agent Miller says, quote, this group was so brazen and they operated under the cover of darkness using what looked like official police cruisers. Sound familiar, Danielle? Yep. Now, I couldn't find confirmation, but I do think the tip about um, Grabluski stealing a car that looked like a mm -hmm. police cruiser might have been used in this way. Yeah, um, probably. Agent Miller continues, they even had a vanity plate on the car that said arson. You're joking. Yeah, Just but, like not even trying to hide it, man. Well, but think about this. You see a police car. It looks like a police car. It's got a vanity mm -hmm. plate that says arson. Every Boston police officer that would see them thought that they were part of an arson squad. Mm-hmm. That they were legit so they can they could watch these things they could be on scene and just and no one would question it no one would question it uh grabluski cooperated with the investigators he secretly recorded conversations with the other members of the arson ring where they were discussing their future mm -hmm. plans and then he turned those over eventually all of the men would be brought in the bust would result in an 83 count federal indictment the Whoa. indictments allege perjury, obstruction of justice, threatening of witnesses, and destruction of evidence, as well as conspiracy. The New York Times would report that due to the number of fires that were set, this was the largest single arson case in history. Assistant U.S. Attorney Mark Robinson described it as a massive conspiracy to burn down the city of Boston. So eight guys in total. Six of the men would plead guilty and wind up testifying against others in the ring. Yeah. Uh, Ray Norton Jr., a 14-year veteran Boston firefighter, was eventually found Ooh. guilty and sentenced to six years in prison. 
Donald Stackpole, the fake fire chief who actually thinks firefighters are overpaid and underworked, uh, he would also be convicted and sentenced to 40 years in federal prison. He would uh, also plead guilty to state charges that gave him an additional 20 years in state prison, but the judge let him serve those concurrently. Um, the sentences for the other men ranged from five to 40 years. U.S. District Judge Zobel reportedly said during the sentencing that, quote, these were either acts of terrorism or sheer malice, though mm -hmm. I don't know which. And yeah. the judge called the crew urban terrorists, which is certainly true. Um, yeah. 219 fires would be attributed to the Boston arson ring, but it's believed they could be responsible for up to 260. Despite the ridiculous number of fires, Danielle, there were no reported deaths. You know what? I'm very thankful for that. Because that could have been really bad. Yeah, I mean, basically... And that was like one of the things about my story, too. I was like, can we not harm someone? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, please? Yeah, basically, they, you know, I mean, they were firefighters and police officers, and that was just part of the thing. They were going to do this, but they, were, they weren't going to let people be hurt. Yeah. Almost. There's a little bit of a condition yeah. in here. Oh, no. Um, okay. But thanks in part to many of the locations, most of the locations were abandoned or the time mm -hmm. frames when they were doing this was in the middle of the night when there wasn't people there. Um, however, numerous firefighters did suffer injuries, nearly 300 in total across all these different occurrences. Oh, boy. In one particular case, uh, two firefighters were permanently disabled when a roof collapsed on them while they were fighting one of the arson fires, which was started at a Marine Corps barracks. And in that case, the ceiling collapses. It actually lands on 22 firefighters. Mm, yeah. But two of them uh, suffered permanent disabilities. Yeah. Oh, the people that, you know, they want to support and bring employees back. Like, what on earth? The, I mean, the whole that logic. That's so sad. I would feel so pissed off yeah i mean the whole logic of this just the you know oh they're they're cutting our funding and our buddies are losing their jobs let's go start more fires and really show them how i'm like what how we're needed and you know and the thing is, is about that you know they were watching exactly what was happening and even after knowing people were getting hurt they were still continuing yeah. it they didn't care the same people that they think they're trying to protect they were repeatedly hurting. These guys had the firsthand experience to know how dangerous that is going into exactly. a burning building. So, yeah. Yeah. And like, not that it really matters, but like these people were going in, they were, there was no one in these buildings, you know, they're abandoned. They're just trying to get the fire under control. Yeah. So they're suffering and they're not even necessarily doing it to save human life. It's just to protect, you know what I mean? Yeah. I hope you get what I'm saying. No, no and I do. That's yeah. just. After the Boston arson ring was caught, Fires in the city dropped dramatically. At the peak of their operation, Boston was dealing with four major fires a night. But by the end... That's insane. Isn't that crazy? That's a ton. But by the end of the 1980s, they were dealing with four major fires every year. Wow. <laughs> That's They were just having the time of their I mean, life doing this. It's crazy. It is crazy. But Danielle, <laughs> yeah. big question. I mean, the title of this episode, who, mm -hmm. who was Mr. Flair? At yeah, least. that's what I want to know. Who is this Marvel character? Yeah, who's the person that sent the letter? It was actually Greg Bemis. He was part of the group. Okay. He was a Boston Housing Authority police officer. And in a really weird twist, I couldn't believe this when I saw this and put this together. He was one of the people that was feeding tips to ATF agent Miller, including the one about Grabluski possibly stealing this car that yeah. looks like a police car. So this guy, what? he's part of the group. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if like maybe he didn't like him, like maybe there was some kind of rift in the group, but he starts Probably. yeah, he starts feeding information out to the ATF agent that basically takes this ring down. Yeah, something tells me there was something going on in there and I mean that would make sense considering he had a name for himself. Yeah. I mean <laughs> So I'm sure he wanted to be the top dog and that may not have been the case. Maybe. Yeah, that's true. Maybe he was the one that wanted but I'm Mr. Flair. He's Mr. Flair. He wanted yeah. the most attention. <clears throat> Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, Agent Miller says, Greg never once was angry at us for arresting him. He used to send us Christmas cards. <laughs> I feel like that would be me if I was ever arrested. I know. I'd be like, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thanks. 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 <laughs> uh, Greg Bemis even took the picture that is on the cover of Agent Miller's book, which is titled Burn, Boston, Burn. Wow. 
A big thank you to the Boston Globe, the Associated Press, New York Times, law.justia.com, grunge.com, and charlestownbridge.com. Man, you know, I don't know how comforted I am after this episode. <laughs> <laughs> These people that we look up to and trust and yeah. I'm just really not sure. That's, I mean, <laughs> but I feel like we all know there's this thing of people who want that sort of power usually put themselves in those positions of power to get away with it. But yeah, yeah. I find it interesting though, because I don't know, there's gotta be something more to it and I wanna research it more, but it seems like when it comes to these like not specialized things like the police we know sometimes someone will become a police officer to abuse that power but it seems a lot more frequent in things like firefighting or bomb squads or things like that and i wonder why yeah yeah maybe it is something about the type of personalities that are attracted to, yeah. to those positions there there's got to be some correlation there let's see if we can make you feel just a, a touch better here um the book details what happened to mm -hmm. several of the arson ring. Uh, Greg Bemis still lives in Massachusetts. Yeah. I'm sure he's still sending Christmas cards to Agent Miller. Probably. Um, mm -hmm. And Grabluski served his time, got out, changed his name, also lives in Massachusetts. Uh, the fake fire chief, Donald Stackpole, yeah. he was released from prison after serving 22 years in total. He passed away back in 2012. Um, former ATF spe Special Agent Miller believes that such an arson ring couldn't happen in the 21st century. I don't think so. Yeah, he says, quote, first of all, there are not that many vacant buildings anymore in Boston because real estate prices are so high. Also, mm -hmm. back then we had no cell phones, no GPS or surveillance cameras all over. Plus, fire investigation has come a long way since then and is more sophisticated. Uh, as a matter of fact, 50% of the proceeds for his book sales go directly mm -hmm. toward improving fire investigation and also oh awesome yeah also helping burn victims so uh yeah which that hits my heart because my sister was actually a burn victim oh. before she passed and my grandparents house unfortunately at one point caught on fire so i'm like a huge advocate for pushing people out there to help these investigations and yeah all of that yeah which well if you guys want to check it out you can go to burnbostonburn.com <laughs> buy a copy of that book and know that you're helping people along the way with that too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, just as you are trying to make us feel better, my extra story. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to extra stories, Danielle. Let's my extra story is making me just not feel any better at all. <laughs> and even more so because it's in North Carolina. Uh Oh, uh Oh, okay. So in 2018, 10 volunteer firefighters were arrested after it was found that they had conspired to set fires to, get this, abandoned buildings and wooded areas in rural North Carolina. Here we go. While nobody was ever harmed, thankfully, they're basically just redoing your stories, essentially what this is sounding like. I'm so serious. It's like a little alarming. Um, it ended up taking a year-long investigation, like a ridiculous amount of resources and man hours to figure out who was behind all of these fires. Now, the group itself, they weren't even all from the same volunteer fire department. Mm, okay. Yeah, there's a it was weird like thing. all over the county. There's a weird thing about mm. um, like these fire bugs, as they refer to, like they become fans mm -hmm. of fire. And there's even groups yeah. that get together mm -hmm. that are these people that are fans of yep. fire in this way. Yeah. Yeah. And so this particular group consisted of all people from the ages of like 17 all the way to 42. One of them was a former police officer. Oh. Um, another one was a former Department of Corrections employee. And I mean, they were just going out. And in North Carolina, this is like a big farming community, especially where this is, which is, you know, uh, way too close for comfort. And I will not be saying out loud, yeah. but in this area, like even on my property, I have two separate old tobacco barns. Mm -hmm. Those things go up in flames like instantly. Like there's just old tobacco barns and, you know, places where people would hang their corn. They're everywhere. It's so easy to go and find an abandoned building here. Yeah. yeah. And I was asked, I was actually asking John before this, I was like, is it really common to have like volunteer firefighters? Cause where I am, I have, <laughs> man, this is sitting too close to home. <laughs> Through the woods is a volunteer firefighter department. <laughs> 
<laughs> we actually saw them like you could hear them training the other night at like 11 p.m yeah yeah well think of the alternative danielle i mean basically if there's not enough money for funding out <clears throat> yeah. there that's that's what you need to have you know that's i mean that's what we run on yeah. Yeah. and i just bought a pork loin from them to raise money from yeah. <laughs> the other yeah. day yep. they i don't know what the woman's auxiliary is but my neighbor across the street keeps asking me to be a part of it. It says, has something to do with the fire department. I don't know. The guy at the gas station across the street from me, he like owns the gas station, runs a farm, and is like the chief of this volunteer. This is the kind of community I live in. But like it's a little it's a little scary. And with this particular story, I guess there were three individuals that all tried to join the fire department, the volunteer fire department at the same time. Yeah. And looking back, the guy was like, they were way too excited mm -mm. about this. Like they were really, really excited about all of our training that we did. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. It's like, you know, sometimes it's great. It's, it's, it's needed, especially in a place like where I live, but it's scary. That's, that's part of, I think it goes back to that aspect where you think trying to figure out the psychology of it. Like there has to yeah. be something in someone for them to be excited about that work in some yeah. way, especially uh -huh. like thinking about for fire, uh, for a volunteer fire department, you're already working a regular day job. You got a family, mm -hmm. you've got a pager or a cell phone that goes off in the middle of the night and you got to jump in mm -hmm. your boots and get to a scene. I mean, like you got to be committed. Like you really mm -hmm. have to have a certain level within you of, Hey, I really want to help in this way. Or um, yep. you've got something in you about, Oh, Oh yeah. 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 More mm -hmm. flames. Like, you know, exactly. And how do you tell yeah, the difference? The other. Like, how do you weed that out? I don't know. I don't know, but yeah. Ooh. Um, well, earlier this year, in March of 2022, the Daily Mail reported on an arson attempt in a gated community in Australia. Now, Danielle, there is CCTV footage that shows these two young men, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, <clears throat> these guys are jumping the gate and going to their target, which is a car. And they're picked up by at least five cameras along the way. Like when you watch this footage, like they have their whole trip of them coming in to do this. It might as well be like, Hi. And seriously, yeah, there's, there's, you see their faces and they're, yeah, they're walking in. But when they get to the last section of the last camera that they come in on, all of a uh -huh. sudden their shirts are like wrapped up around their face. So you can't see their face anymore. You're a little late. Yeah. Uh, they, they're wearing shorts. One of them is in flip flops. <laughs> But they get to this car, they finally cover up their faces, they throw a bunch of fuel on the back of the car, they light it, and there's this big, you know, initial burst of, yeah. of fireball. And you can see they get completely freaked, and then they start go running down the street. And all of a sudden, I kid you not, Danielle, it turns into a scene from the Three Stooges. One <laughs> of them falls down. The, uh, and not even the guy with the flip flops. He's still he's still going. I was fine. about to say it has to be the guy with the flip flops, nah. right? There's that was a bad choice. Yeah, no, the other guy first. <laughs> other guy goes down. Guy with the flip flops runs right into him. He takes no. him down. So they both go down. Uh, one of them is hurt for a second on the ground. You could see him like rubbing his knee, and oh, then all no. of a sudden they're like, "Oh shoot, we're running away from we a fire!" We have to keep running. Yeah. <laughs> so you see them jump up and they go running off in opposite directions. There's like a Y. Are you serious? Yeah, there's like a Y at the end of the road. <laughs> they go running <laughs> off in opposite directions, and then all of a sudden one of them realizes he's not with his buddy. He turns around, comes running back through the camera, going to the other side. Then <laughs> I kid you not, a second later they both come back into the camera, running off in the other direction like it oh it looks like there was no planning here it, i swear to god it looks like it's from a charlie chaplin film it is amazing and uh when the press <laughs> gets a hold of it they would refer to these guys as dumb and dumber <laughs> and that fits yeah and it does police uh were reportedly cutting them a bit of slack about the fall because it was dark <laughs> uh detective senior sergeant eh. mark proctor said quote I dare say they targeted that particular vehicle, but given their other actions, I, yeah, probably not. I wouldn't be surprised if they got it wrong. <laughs> they, they probably did. Yeah, they do appear to be either alcohol affected or just plain, uh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I read your mind. No, it was him. That was a quote. That was a direct quote from, <clears throat> from Senior Sergeant Mark Well, I read his mind then. Yeah. Dumb and dumber. I mean, like... <laughs> That reminds me of kids running away from like a party when the cops show up or like something along those lines. How can you be so dedicated to starting a fire and then totally not think about what's happening afterwards?
Right. There's one of two things going on there. Either the like in this case, it looks like the the ball of initial flame, the initial burst just of it scared them so bad. They're just like, ah. yeah, it just like freaked them out. Or <laughs> I mean, if we are talking about these guys that are getting like, you mm -hmm. know, hypercharged around this situation, it could be that, too, that all of a sudden, you know, it's it's like their hot girlfriend just showed up or something and just yeah. like, oh, there she is. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I don't know. Oh, man. Flip flops. The flip flop guy. <laughs> Uh, no planning. Uh -huh. No planning was put into this. Well, this next one, there's a video of it. And I really hope I can find it to send it to you for you to put it in here because... Please do. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2021, police in Honolulu were contacted after a man started a small brush fire in North Kona. Now, the fire wasn't very big. It was easily maintained. But when police arrived, they were told that the man chose a bizarre getaway. So we've got like tons of our topics rolled up into this one small story. There we go. This man started the brush fire and then immediately went to a nearby home where he stole a push lawnmower. A push? A push lawnmower. I thought mower. it was a riding mower. Oh. <clears throat> no. Okay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it is a push lawnmower and he hopped onto it and proceeded to very slowly flee the scene of the crime. I guess in the area there was like bumper to bumper traffic. And honestly, I, I can't even begin to explain what he was thinking. I really can't. All I know is that there was traffic and for some reason he assumed that hopping on a push lawnmower and like holding on to the handle was going to get him away faster than just, you know, his feet. I have to see this footage because I don't understand. Like, is he using it as a scooter? Is he putting like he's sitting on top of like where the engine is like, you know, like where you put the gas in and all that. He's yeah. like literally like crammed up on top of it with his arm up behind him, like holding on to the handle. This is insane. It's, is it moving? I pro I could walk faster than it was moving. OK, so it's got it's got like a motorized it's function. Moving. It's, it is moving on its own. But <laughs> well, you know, how sometimes you have like those push lawn mowers yeah. that have like the assist. assist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you don't have to shove the thing up a hill. Right. right. <laughs> but like it does not have an actual motor motor behind it that propels you very fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's I'm serious when I'm t like and there's people in their cars just like videotaping him cracking up because it's like where are like get up and you could literally run five times as fast. That is hilarious. And you see him just like like hop it up and like try to shove it forward faster like he's going to get I don't know. I don't know. I have no explanation for it. Wow. I have none. But man, that was his plan. Start a fire, hop off, and leave on a push mower. There's a bunch of amazing video around this topic. Um, uh, there sure is. People are... Yeah. Hmm. Back in 2015, mirror.co.uk reported that a man in Russia was trying his hand, wink, wink, at being an arsonist. A local security camera caught the event as the man approached a car wash. As he's spreading the fuel around, some mm. seems to get on his arm. Mm -mm. He goes to start the fire and suddenly it's running up his arm to his chest and nearing his face. The man completely freaks and goes running across a field. But there's something interesting about the field, Danielle. It's covered in snow. Yet he keeps just running across it with his arm on fire. <laughs> Soon... He trips and falls into a snowbank, realizing that there's this magical white stuff on the ground everywhere that yeah. could have instantly put out his flaming arm. <laughs> the oh, man. The building that he was trying to burn, it was fine. There was minimal damage. But to the ego of the would-be arsonist, I think the damage was substantial. The video showing his arson <clears throat> attempt was named Flaming Idiot Arsonist Gets His Fingers Burned. I mean, maybe in a moment of panic, he just is focused on running. Like it's like a fight or flight mode type of deal. But your arms I on fire like, and you're running across yeah, snow and you're running through <laughs> snow. Oh, goodness. How do we find you them? Can't, How do we find I them? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is tonight, Danielle, I'm going to I'm going to buy a red station wagon. I'm going to dress up oh as a fire chief for uh the lord and arts community fire department okay and uh i'm gonna start perfect yeah going to fire scenes and heckling <laughs> firefighters look oh goodness i don't want to see any videos of it 
I'm just going to pretend like you're not. <laughs> yeah, <doing> please it. <laughs> don't. <laughs> I just can't even begin to understand any of this. I can't. And like the rate of failure in terms of people trying to start fires and in turn harming themselves, you would think that alone would deter people from mm-hmm. doing it. But mm-hmm. no, mm-mm, no. <laughs> All right, you guys. Moment of truth. Who's going to win this month? You voted for John the past two times in a row. I think the only fair option. <laughs> <laughs> I like where this is going. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You guys get to vote. Whichever way you vote is absolutely perfect with either of us. Who told the best absurd arson story? You can vote on our Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast and you can vote there. We do have a link in the description box. You can also click the letter I still up in the corner and vote. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys are awesome. We have so much fun over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It's something you don't want to miss. You hear tons about me and John, all of my farm updates. It's, it's, it's an experience. That's the best way I can describe it. (laughs) It is different. It is different. (laughs) (laughs) Go and check it out. Plus new patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Coming up for you guys next month on July 1st, we are going to be visiting my neighbors to the north as we talk about Canadian crimes. What is that going to be a boot? A boot? (laughs) I can't wait. I don't know. I, th- I think it's, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just so looking forward to this. I have no idea what to expect. Me either. I feel like every other time we've done like a specific location, we have like an idea. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. Canadians. Maybe it's a wild card. Maybe if I could find like something hockey related or something related okay, to, to poutine or yeah, yeah, I, or like some crazy wilderness. Yeah. Moose. Yeah. I'm going to look situation. for something that's kind of got a particular Canadian flair, yeah. but it's going to be interesting. It's, it's, it's a big country. I'm sure there's a <laughs> lot is. of crime up there. Oh yeah. This show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen and the wonderful, fantastic, amazing John. Lorden. Oh, too much. Thank you, Danielle. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell them about it. Tell your friends, yep. tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. Like we do. I love being here. <laughs> Me too. Lord and Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye.